The American Economic Foundation points out that among all living creatures, man alone is placed on earth without a built-in book of instructions for successful living. Aside from a strong instinct to protect himself with weapons and to better himself with tools, man is born without knowledge of his own nature. Insects, animals, and birds know instinctively and intuitively what they have to do and how they have to act in order to live successfully. They do not have to wonder where they come from, where they're going, what rights and obligations they have, whether they were meant to live free or in bondage. Men, on the other hand, don't even agree on what kind of government best suits their social and economic needs. Man has weak instincts, and to add to his confusions, he has free will, which means that he can successfully contradict his own impulses. Man desires peace, yet is easily stimulated to war. He treasures private possessions, yet justifies stealing. He is capable of both tenderness and brutality. In other words, from the beginning, our ancestors were the original crazy mixed-up kids, and it must be admitted modern man is still far from rational. His only clues to the rules that will assure an orderly, productive life lie in the history of human experience, the written record of the socio-economic experiments and ideas that succeeded and of those that failed. The trouble with record-keeping, however, is twofold. First, man did not learn to write until about 5,000 years ago, and second, most of the writers of history have not always told the truth. In the written history of man, however, can be found a set of operating principles that has been proven many times over to fit the nature of man and to create a climate of progress. By studying these principles, man can gain knowledge of his own nature and learn how to act in ways that benefit rather than injure him. And heading the list is man's most important need, freedom. There is no evidence in history that man can prosper without the exercise of freedom. For example, in the communist nations of Russia and China, where more than 50% of the labor force is devoted to agriculture, food is chronically in short supply. In the United States, however, about 7% of the free labor force raises more food than the people can possibly eat. And along with bountiful Canada, we sell food to Russia and China to make up their shortages. And I just read in the Miami Herald that looks like we'll be feeding them for some years to come. The most obvious natural trait of economic man is that he does his best work, that is, makes the best use of his muscular and mental energy when he is free. He produces best when he is making his own plans and devising his own methods of carrying them out, with the knowledge that whatever the results may be, they are his results, and that whatever the fruit of his labor may be, they too are his. So it's clear, therefore, that the first requirement of prosperity is individual freedom of choice and action. But I'm not too sure that this story is being properly told to our young people in school, nor has it been properly told for decades. In June 1972, an article appeared in the Intellectual Digest titled, Never Underestimate the Power of Children. It was written by Rudolf Dreikers, M.D., Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry, Chicago Medical School, and Director of the Alfred Adler Institute of Chicago, and by Bernice Bronya Grunwald and Floyd C. Pepper, who is Coordinator of Instruction, Multnomah's County Intermediate Education District, Portland, Oregon. In the article, it's pointed out that although we assume that many children could achieve more than they do, in many instances we equate what the child is doing with what he can do. Educational progress depends on the ability of the teacher to perceive the untapped resources of the student and to develop techniques of using these resources to best advantage. In both regards, our present culture is remiss. We hardly acknowledge the tremendous potential of each child, and we simply lack in our educational institutions the ability to evoke their latent talents. Indeed, it often seems that we systematically prevent the development of children while trying too hard to foster it. They go on to write, While we cannot base our estimate of the child's potential on any reliable proof, we find some agreement among people with vision that we're all operating at about 15% of our potential ability. If anything close to this estimate is correct, then we can attribute this general artificial restriction in our functions to the practice of impeding the development of our children. We have advocated for many years the proposition, they write, that children could learn within the first ten years everything that presently a college graduate knows. And at the end of the article, they write, The force behind every human action is its goal. To a certain extent, everybody knows what he wants and he acts accordingly. 
more frequently he is not aware of his goals. The consequences of his actions, however, reveal his intentions, whether he's aware of them or not. The individual has the power to move in any self-determined direction. All his actions, qualities, and characteristics, as well as his emotions, can be understood by his effort to find a place for himself in society. A child's actions may be based on faulty assumptions about life and about himself. Although his behavior may appear to be inappropriate, it reflects his conviction that this is the only possible way for him to be significant. He cannot perceive reality as it is, only as he interprets it. How the child looks at life, at others, and at himself, and what he decides to do about it, depends on his private logic. Asking a child why he does something wrong is useless. He doesn't know. The trained educator has to help him to understand himself, his goals, his private logic. Well, it was an excellent article. In what I consider to be a consistently excellent magazine, and I recommend it to you. Let's take another look at that line that goes, The individual has the power to move in any self-determined direction. All his actions, qualities, and characteristics, as well as his emotions, can be understood by his effort to find a place for himself in society. A child's actions may be based on faulty assumptions about life and about himself. Amen. The way most children are raised in the home and in the school is to give them a completely cockeyed picture of what life in a free society can be like. They're taught to play it safe, to avoid risks of any sort, to fit in, to conform, to be one of the group, one more sheep in the herd. They're taught to tiptoe through life instead of dance and run through it. And their store of information regarding basic economics and why our system offers unlimited opportunities for growth and fulfillment to the individual is minuscule, or more usually, absent. One of my favorite thinkers and writers, Leo Rostin, wrote a piece for a world magazine titled The Power of Positive Nonsense, in which he debunked some popularly held opinions. Popularly held opinions are almost always wrong. He begins by quoting the American humorist Frank Hubbard, who once commented, "'Taint what a man don't know that hurts him. It's what he knows that just ain't so.' And he says, "'I know of no sounder, truer precept.' I never cease being dumbfounded by the unbelievable things people believe. The cockamamie can't. They convert into credos. The trumpery they never question. The twiddle, twaddle, and fourteen-carat drivel they incorporate into that body of unknowledge, the veracity of which everyone, in quotes, accepts. I sometimes think, he writes, that nothing on our dizzy globe is more widely spread, more deeply rooted, more revered or fiercely defended than baloney. And as one of several examples, he cites the hallowed phrase, idle curiosity. I get an acute attack of the glums, he writes, when I consider how many upright, unthinking citizens use that oxymoron day in and day out without the slightest awareness of its idiocy. If you think about it for as long as six seconds, you surely must realize that the one thing curiosity cannot ever, ever be is idle. And then going back to the article on children by Dr. Dreckers, the greatest obstacle to growth and development, to learning and to improved function, or even to continued function on the level already reached, is discouragement, doubt in one's own ability. Our present methods of raising children confront them with a series of discouraging experiences. One either does for them what they can do for themselves, protecting and spoiling them, or one scolds and punishes. In either case, the child is deprived of the experience of his own strength. So if you think for a moment that our kids are not presented with the real facts as to their potential for growth in a free economy, and combine the fact that they are repressed into conformity with minimal standards of achievement, and consider that they see their parents and neighbors living largely parasitical lives, doing no more than they have to in order to squeak by, and that they often live in a home environment of intellectual and creative poverty, and you begin to understand why they carry from 85 to 95 percent of their true potential for achievement, joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment to the grave with them, unused and undreamed of. The idea is seldom, how much can I do, how far can I go, it is instead, how safe can I play it? How can I get by with a passing grade? How can I keep out of trouble? And the odds are about 95 to 5, give or take a few percentage points either way, that you and I were raised in that kind of an atmosphere, one of passive submission. 
The way millions live in our society, they might as well be living under a communist or socialist form of government, with all decisions being made for them by a small group at the top. Except for going to the polls on election day, they're really not free, not free at all. They tread a narrow path and live in a state of uneasy anxiety. They're taught to live that way, and they never get over it. I read one time about the headmaster of an English lower grade school who always made it a point to visit a new class and ask the children the same question. He would say, It's very important that every one of you knows the correct answer to this question. Why are you in school? One by one, he would ask the children to answer the question, and they would try their best but never come up with the right answer. After they had all stammered out their wrong answers, he would say, None of you answered the question correctly. Here is the correct answer. You are in school to learn to think. And the next time I ask you that question, don't just parrot the right answer. Understand it. Think about it. You are in school to learn to think. Well, I don't know how successful he was in teaching this most valuable of lessons. It certainly stuck in the mind of the man who told the story. He was Gavin Maxwell, author of the fine and beautiful book Ring of Bright Water, among others. The children in that school, like Gavin Maxwell, were fortunate. But we know most teachers don't teach their young charges how to think because they themselves usually haven't the foggiest notion of how to think. The odds against our having had such a teacher are great, and the odds against our learning to think in our homes as youngsters are about the same. But we can learn to think through re-education, through realizing what the opportunities are in our society today, and that we're normally functioning on a fraction of our real potential and realize that we can definitely bring more and more of the power of our minds to bear in our lives. Once a person has learned how to think, he has just about all the advantage he needs in a society such as ours. He can have an interesting, productive, and successful life. He need never remain for long in a situation he finds not to his liking. He can change it, or move from one thing to another. Knowing how to think and thus solve his problems as they arise and the problems of others, he has the kind of inner security that permits him to live abundantly in a state of what others would think of as insecurity all the years of his life. We've all seen people filing through one half of a double door, a long line of them following each other through half of the door and waiting needlessly in line to do it. And then you've seen someone open the other half of the door and breeze through. Immediately, people will plunge in behind him, but it took him to think, to ask himself, I wonder why we're all going through half of that door like a bunch of stupid sheep. It was designed to handle twice the traffic, so he opens it and he goes through life like that, opening obvious doors, at least obvious to him, while others follow his lead. He'll do that in whatever field he chooses, simply because somewhere along the line he learned to think. Perhaps it was a wise teacher like our English headmaster. It may have been his mother or father. But somewhere along the line he learned to the almost limitless power of his mind. He learned to be curious. He learned about the gold mine between his ears, and he formed the habit of using it. Successful people are not people without problems, as a wise educator once put it. Problems are much the same for all of us. Successful people are simply people who've learned to solve their problems. They've learned to think. We mentioned at the beginning that the first requirement of prosperity is individual freedom of choice and action. Several years ago, Frederick R. Capel, chairman of the board of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, told about a study the Bell System made of the relationship between profits and performance in American industry. They started with two questions. Does profit do anything? Is it only a result, or does it also cause things to happen that affect our economy? Their conclusion was that good profit, good business performance, and healthy economic progress all go together. But the men who made this study went further. Good profit, they suggested, does much more than parallel good performance. It's one of the essential factors in bringing good performance about. The other essentials named were good management and a good product. In other words, good profit is by no means merely a result. It is also causative, dynamic, and energizing. Of the businesses analyzed, those that earned well had better growth records with all that connotes of value delivered to consumers than those that earned poorly. The more profitable companies put more investment, including more retained earnings, into new and improved equipment. They did more research and more innovating. They offered better job opportunities, and they contributed more to community well-being. Thus, the study group suggested that good profit should be regarded as a prime 
cause of economic and social progress. Profit, they felt, is not merely an end result of the business process, but a lively functional element that does indeed cause things to happen. Now, this is the point that so many well-meaning but off-base social reformers miss. They keep seeing profit and the average working person as somehow separate and unallied. They fail to see how profit earned by a commercial organization can do any good at all for society as a whole. But that's exactly what it does best. Profits are not drained off and put in vaults or buried in bomb-proof caves. Profits go to work. They're invested right back into the economy in the form of new and better tools, expanded industry and products and services. Profits go into the pockets of all the people. The best-paid human beings on earth, with the highest standards of living on earth, will always be found in the zones of profit. The least profitable a company or a country or an entire part of the world, the more downtrodden will be its people in all areas of their lives. They will have less money, less food, poorer shelter, poorer schools, poorer medical attention, and so on. Profits to a business can be compared to a salary for a person. The more there is, the more gets pumped back into the economy, the more is spent. Cutting down on profits is like cutting down on a man's wages. It doesn't only hurt him and his family. It hurts the whole community. Everybody loses. Even taxes come out of profits. Profit is a prime cause of economic and social progress. It is not merely an end result of a well-managed business, but a lively functional element that causes things to happen. And I believe that we're swinging around to a well-ordered, human-directed attitude toward business and profits never before known in the human community. I don't think we've even gotten started yet. For every good idea that's been developed in the past, there are a thousand. There are ten thousand yet to be developed. In thinking, in getting ideas, what are the underlying factors of a really great idea? What causes a person to suddenly get an idea that will change his life or even the world? One of the best descriptions of exactly what it takes was written by John Livingston Lowe's, who lived from 1867 to 1945. He said that a great idea requires three vital factors, which he called the well and the vision and the will. The well is our store of knowledge, of facts. It's the great chaotic jumble of facts, ideas, and information that we've stored away in our mental computer. The more the better. That's why, as Leo Rostin says, there's no such thing as idle curiosity. John Lowe's puts it this way. The notion that the creative imagination, especially in its highest exercise, has little or nothing to do with facts, is one of the pseudodoxia epidemica which die hard. He means, of course, that if you think great ideas can come from a shallow well, you're probably as wrong as you've ever been in your lifetime. The deeper and better stocked your well of information, the better. Next, the vision. You need some arresting stimulus, which often comes by accident, to give you the enlightened vision you need. He put it this way. In genius of the highest order, the sudden, incalculable, and puissant energy which pours up from the hidden depths is controlled by a will which serves a vision, the vision which sees in chaos the potentiality of form. Darwin had been accumulating masses of facts which pointed to a momentous conclusion, but they pointed through a maze of baffling inconsistencies. Then, all at once, the flash of vision came. He tells us in his autobiography, I can remember the very spot on the road whilst in my carriage when to my joy the solution occurred to me. And then and only then does the will come into play. With the infinite toil of exposition was slowly framed from the obdurate facts the great statement of the theory of evolution. For Milton, the leap of the imagination in a garden at Woolsthorpe on a day in 1665, from the fall of an apple to an architectonic conception, cosmic in its scope and grandeur, is one of the dramatic moments in the history of human thought. But in that pregnant moment there flashed together the profound and daring observations and conjectures of a long period in the pockets of all the people. The best-paid human beings on earth, with the highest standards of living on earth, will always be found in the zones of profit. The least profitable a company or a country or an entire part of the world the more downtrodden will be its people in all areas of their lives. They will have less money, less food, poorer shelter, poorer schools, poorer medical attention, and so on. Profits to a business can be compared to a salary for a person. The more there is, the more gets pumped back into the economy, the more is spent. Cutting down on profits is like cutting down on a man's wages. It doesn't only hurt him and his family. It hurts the whole community. Everybody loses. 
Even taxes come out of profits. Profit is a prime cause of economic and social progress. It is not merely an end result of a well-managed business, but a lively functional element that causes things to happen. And I believe that we're swinging around to a well-ordered, human-directed attitude toward business and profits never before known in the human community. I don't think we've even gotten started yet. For every good idea that's been developed in the past, there are a thousand. There are ten thousand yet to be developed. In thinking, in getting ideas, what are the underlying factors of a really great idea? What causes a person to suddenly get an idea that will change his life or even the world? One of the best descriptions of exactly what it takes was written by John Livingston Lowe's, who lived from 1867 to 1945. He said that a great idea requires three vital factors, which he called the well and the vision and the will. The well is our store of knowledge, of facts. It's the great chaotic jumble of facts, ideas, and information that we've stored away in our mental computer. The more the better. That's why, as Leo Rostin says, there's no such thing as idle curiosity. John Lowe's puts it this way. The notion that the creative imagination, especially in its highest exercise, has little or nothing to do with facts, is one of the pseudodoxia epidemica which die hard. He means, of course, that if you think great ideas can come from a shallow well, you're probably as wrong as you've ever been in your lifetime. The deeper and better stocked your well of information, the better. Next, the vision. You need some arresting stimulus, which often comes by accident, to give you the enlightened vision you need. He put it this way. In genius of the highest order, the sudden, incalculable, and puissant energy which pours up from the hidden depths is controlled by a will which serves a vision, the vision which sees in chaos the potentiality of form. Darwin had been accumulating masses of facts which pointed to a momentous conclusion, but they pointed to a maze of baffling inconsistencies. Then, all at once, the flash of vision came. He tells us in his autobiography, I can remember the very spot on the road whilst in my carriage when to my joy the solution occurred to me. And then and only then does the will come into play. With the infinite toil of exposition was slowly framed from the obdurate facts the great statement of the theory of evolution. For Milton, the leap of the imagination in a garden at Woolsthorpe on a day in 1665, from the fall of an apple to an architectonic conception, cosmic in its scope and grandeur, is one of the dramatic moments in the history of human thought. But in that pregnant moment there flashed together the profound and daring observations and conjectures of a long period of years, and upon the instant of illumination followed other years of rigorous and protracted labor before the Principia appeared. With all great ideas, there was first a long collection of information for the deep well of the subconscious mind, the storage of information. Then, the vision, the great idea itself. Whether it was a sculpture, a book, a great piece of music, a painting, an idea in mechanics or architecture or business or anything. It can come in the middle of the night or while you're eating breakfast on an airplane or watering your lawn anywhere. And then comes the will, the determination to do the work necessary, no matter how long it takes, to make the idea a thing of reality. The well, the vision, and the will. The three steps necessary for the completion of a great idea. It's been written that the road to Zanadu, as we have traced it, is the road of the human spirit and the imagination voyaging through chaos and reducing it to clarity and order is the symbol of all the quests which lend glory to our dust. In talking about ideas that we want to pass along to our kids, in school and more importantly in the home, of all the qualities that parents can instill in the children, which would you say is the most important? Sometime back, the editors of a business magazine conducted a survey on what qualities it takes to be successful. They didn't indicate what they meant by successful, but since the survey was by the editors of a business magazine, it was naturally assumed that what was meant was success in business. Well, interestingly enough, the same number one quality emerged for success in business that came up for success as a father or mother. And do you know what that single quality is? One word. Integrity. 
There are millions today who will laugh at that, but the odds are good that neither they nor their youngsters are doing too well. Do you remember when General Dean was taken prisoner during the Korean War? The Chinese communists led him to believe that he was soon to be executed. It was a calculated part of their torture, and General Dean thought they were going to kill him. In what he thought was to be his last letter to his wife, he included instructions for his son, and he wrote, Tell Bill, the word is integrity. Children who are taught the importance of integrity never seem to lose it. It becomes a part of their being, their way of doing things, and more than anything else, it will guarantee their success in life as persons. Integrity is what a man wants in his wife, and she in him. That's what we look for and hope for in a doctor or a dentist, the man who designs and builds our home, the man we work for, and the people who work under us. It's what we want more than anything else in a politician or an appointed official, in judge and police officers. Integrity is honesty, but much more than the superficial kind of honesty that keeps a person from stealing or cheating. Integrity is a set of mind and character that goes all the way through like good, solid construction. If a person is offered a large bribe and for an instant weighs the size of the bribe against the chance of discovery, he's not an integrious person. He's simply an expedient person, playing it safe, a basic crook. The integrious person cannot countenance a bribe. It goes against his grain. You might as well ask him to flap his arms and fly like a bird. There's no way he can do it. Any more than General Dean could possibly do what the enemy wanted him to do under the threat of execution. It didn't enter his mind. And integrity, or the lack of it, is generally taught in the home, in little as well as big things. In business or in life, the number one quality is integrity. For most people, it would seem getting through life is a matter of managing a compromise between integrity and expediency. Integrity is all well and good, and everybody would like to have the word apply to him, but there are times it is usually thought when it's perhaps best to wink at integrity and indulge in a little larceny or remain silent when to speak one's mind might result in a loss of popularity or ostracism of some kind. As Ortega tells it, the human creature is born into the world in a natural state of disorientation. He is the only creature on earth who is not at home in his environment. He must, and he does, in a godlike fashion, create his own life, his own world. Now, that's an awesome thing to think about. The responsibility is onerous, frightening. To present a white knight-like facade of unblemished and unsullied integrity is not only difficult, to most people, I'm sure, it's also a little ridiculous. The old battle cry of the mob is, everybody does it, why shouldn't I? And that's exactly why the person of integrity doesn't do it. They will ask, what are you trying to be, a boy scout? What's wrong with being a boy scout? Why shouldn't we go straight in a time when such an attitude needs all the recruits it can get? Integrity in business is the surest way on earth to succeed. Sometimes it might seem that what you're doing is going to cut into profits, but it inevitably ends by increasing profits. I was talking to a well-known, highly respected Florida real estate man the other day, and this subject came up. He's been in the real estate business in Florida for more than 30 years and has long been a champion of going the extra mile, doing much more than he needs to in order to get by and earn a profit. He told me that the more he works for the good of the consumer, the customer, and of the community at large, the more money he makes. If he could get by by putting five lots on a piece of property and digging the canal five feet deep, he puts three lots on it and digs the canal 12 feet deep. And if the code requires a landfill of five feet, he makes it seven feet. By so doing, he's earned the admiration and respect of everyone in the community, has built a tremendous reputation for integrity, and has become a millionaire in the process. Call him a Boy Scout, and he'll smile and say, thank you. When we put the well-being of people, who's in Florida for more than 30 years and has long been a champion of going the extra mile, doing much more than he needs to in order to get by and earn a profit, he told me that, the more he works for the good of the consumer, the customer, and of the community at large, the more money he makes. If he could get by by putting five lots on a piece of property and digging the canal five feet deep, he puts three lots on it and digs the canal twelve feet deep. And if the code requires a landfill of five feet, he makes it seven feet. By so doing, he's earned the admiration and respect of everyone in the community, has built a tremendous reputation for integrity, and has become a millionaire in the process. Call him a Boy Scout, and he'll smile and say, thank you. 
When we put the well-being of people in first place, we'll never make a mistake. People first, profit last. And the more you do it, the bigger and better your profits become. It's the old law of cause and effect. In my opinion, there should be courses in integrity. Someone once wrote that if honesty didn't exist, it ought to be invented as the best means of getting rich. But kids don't learn integrity when they see their father bringing home loot from his place of employment, or bragging about how he cheated on his income tax, or lifting towels and other loose impedimenta from a hotel or motel room. Yes, tell Bill the word is integrity. In a product, a service, or a human being, integrity is priceless and can only lead to success in the long run. We've all played golf with people who conveniently forget strokes. They fool no one, least of all the other club members, and they become objects of derision. And every week we read in the newspapers of men, quite often in high places, whose lack of basic integrity has landed them in trouble with the law, with the resulting damage to themselves and the members of their family. They were not taught the importance of integrity as youngsters, and failed to mature and learn the importance of it as adults. I came across a great line the other day. It was written by Emmanuel H. Demby, and it goes, Self-confidence is like a psychological credit card. It's true, and to my mind, the best way to develop self-confidence is to know that you're operating on absolutely sound ground rules. Now, the majority, I'm afraid, does not do that, not because they wouldn't if they knew what the rules are, but because their education is faulty. To again quote Frank Hubbard and Leo Rostin, taint what a man don't know that hurts him. It's what he knows that just ain't so. An excellent book that I enjoyed tremendously and want to reread is The American Idea of Success by Richard M. Huber. Huber gives the best description of why Americans are so hipped on success without really knowing the definition of the word as it applies to our lives I've ever read. He points out that the most important element in the foundation of American civilization was not economic, political, or ethnic. It was religious. Nowhere is the importance of Puritan Protestantism more apparent than in explaining why Americans were ambitious to succeed. The Christian goal of the Middle Ages was to know and do the will of God. Although ambition was not entirely smothered, one was expected to do his duty in the station of life to which it pleased God to call him. The Christian goal of Puritan Protestant America was also to know and do the will of God, except that man's understanding of God's will had changed. The quest for grace became a quest for wealth. If, as Gunnar Murdahl perceived, Americans worshipped success, it was because Americans from early in their history worshipped a God that they were confident wanted them to be a success. The consequences of this conviction were immense. All societies pursue certain objectives that they define as saintly. Yet some societies, like America, ended up wealthy by pursuing what they believed was saintly. Piling up a fortune was a way of worshipping God and a visible proof of his favor. As Eric Fromm has pointed out, this ethic supported the feeling of security and tended to give life meaning and a religious sense of fulfillment. This combination of a stable world, stable possessions, and a stable ethic gave the members of the middle class a feeling of belonging, self-confidence, and pride. Puritan Protestantism ideologically supported productive personal qualities, it may also have psychologically helped to mold such qualities into its believers. How did Puritan Protestantism build in entrepreneurial traits of initiative, self-reliance, and risk-taking? Well, rather than a priestly intermediary standing between man and God within an authoritarian framework, which might have led to passive dependency, Protestantism stressed individual decision-making with no intermediary between man and God. This process translated itself into individual decision-making in secular affairs. The burden of private judgment with respect to sin was carried over to an acceptance of the burden of private judgment in business, a confidence in oneself to make decisions, to innovate, to act. This foundation of religious values and their psychological consequences was strengthened by other causal forces that helped to explain why Americans were ambitious to be successful. Puritanism struck at laziness with the stick of guilt. Capitalistic values tempted ambition with the carrot of self-interest, and by the end of the 18th century, reaching for the carrot was not only for the good of the self, but for the good of all. Adam Smith pronounced the doctrine that the justification for the unregulated pursuit of one's own self-interest was the generally unintentional promotion of the public welfare. Puritanism 
and Adam Smith had bequeathed a good conscience to the businessman. Doctrines of economic and political individualism encouraged the ambitious to get on. What the rights of the voter were to political democracy, the achievement of the self-made man was to economic democracy. Individualism was encouraged by an optimistic belief that one could rise in a land of opportunity. You can't keep a good man down. In the American open-class system, status was attained by achievement rather than by ascription. No titles or legal safeguards protected an individual from skidding into an inferior class position during his own lifetime. At the same time, he was not formally denied entrance into a superior status. Every generation in America has had its nose pressed against the window pane, dreaming above its station, and encouraged to do so by the values of the society. And one of the shaping influences for this competitive drive was the school system. Americans had faith in education as an escalator to lift their children to a higher economic and social position. Designed to arouse the competitive drive in children was a whole battery of marks, prizes, and degrees from the first grade through high school that measured how a student stacked up against his schoolmates. What instilled ambition in a child was a process of thinking in which achievement was measured by a recorded reward. After graduation, the reward was simply shifted to money. And the drive for money was occasioned by more than just the desire for money and what it can buy. Money and the education it confers on following generations in America determines one's social standing. If not in the first generation, certainly if there's enough money in the generations to follow. The most socially prominent families in America are built on nothing but great piles of money. Some of them may be able to trace their ancestry to the Mayflower, but passage on that small and beat-up vessel was not obtained by one's social standing. I think it's a wonderful thing that a person standing in the community does not rest upon the titles of his ancestors. As someone has commented, the best part of such people are often underground. But to equate social standing with a lot of money is just as ridiculous. The fact that a person can buy the biggest house in town and staff it with servants does not in any stretch of the imagination cause him or her to be superior to any other person. To assume such an attitude is a sign of infantile stupidity. If you've got the money, great. Enjoy it and spread it around and pass it along to the kids if you like. But don't get on your high horse because your grandfather had a good idea and some perseverance. But by all means, read The American Idea of Success by Richard M. Huber. It will give you a brilliantly clear picture of just what the title implies. And by so doing, it helps you and me get a clearer picture of what real success as a person is all about. I have a good friend who's a highly paid executive with one of the country's largest corporations. He and his wife have five children, and they have vowed not to leave a dime to any one of them. It's a wonderfully happy family, and the children, now grown and married, are doing fine on their own. But they've known for years not to expect a legacy. I'd be the last person in the world to cheat them of the opportunity and the fun of making it on their own, says their father, and so he arranges to spend every dime of his considerable income every year. He has provided for his retirement, carries enough insurance to protect his wife, and that's it. He has a wonderfully healthy attitude towards money and enjoys it fully without worrying about stacking it up. Money is the harvest of our production and can be used to purchase the production of others. It's a good thing, and with it we can live and enjoy the good life, and that's about it. To ascribe other values to it is a sign of immaturity.